Next, next speaker is come back to Dr. Adolfo Garcia Sastre about the pathogenicity of SARS-CoV-19. Adolfo, what do you want? Okay, can you yes. hear me? Uh, yes. Okay, yes, yes. good. Maybe. This time, this time is fine. Okay. Um, so thanks a lot for inviting me here. Um, uh, you guys told me to talk about pathogenicity of SARS-2 coronavirus, and actually, I don't have too much data on that. Um, we had already great talks about uh, clinical um, outcomes and, and clinical data. Um, so basically, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what can we do, and also uh, some thoughts about the possible estimates of infection that I would like to share, especially with people that know more than me to see whether it makes any sense or not. Um, uh, and um, I'm uh, Adolfo Garcia Sastre. I'm in the director of the Global Health and Emerging Pathogens Institute. I'm located in New York in the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And we like to call ourselves virus fighters because we have been working against multiple viruses, uh, including influenza and dengue and Zika in the past, and now uh, also against, uh, hopefully, trying to do something against this new coronavirus. OK, so let's start um, uh, with uh, what uh, defined a little bit the problem. I, I know you guys have talked about it. Um, I thought it was going to be my first talk, so I go a little bit uh, um, um, fast about it. We know that this uh, outbreak started in December 2019 in Wuhan and that the virus has spread now all around the world. We know that all the problems that are causing, a lot of severe cases and deaths, uh, but uh, most infections actually result in mild respiratory symptoms. However, a percentage of infections develop in severe respiratory disease, which has been called COVID-19. Everybody's susceptible, everybody is, does not have any pre-existing immunity, and this results in rapid increase in the number of cases. And since the virus is new in humans, there is no antivirals, no vaccines, and the only option right now to prevent rapid spread is the use of contention measures like quarantine, social distancing, and hand washing. Now, <clears throat> let me tell you a, a little bit. I think it's speculative, but I want this for discussion also with people that may have uh, more um, expertise in these areas. So I'm going to give you what I think what are my own estimates of numbers of infections using, as an example, Spain. And as a disclosure, I'm, I'm a virologist. Uh, immunologists, but not expert in epidemiology nor in mathematical model of disease. Uh, now, we know from the WHO lethality rate estimates are around 3.4%, which is a very high number, uh, is uh, more than 10 times what it calls um, seasonal influenza every day, every year. And uh, we know as, as March 31st, there are uh, 810,000 reported cases with around 39,000 of deaths, so actually the mortality rate is 4.8 according to reported cases and deaths. One of the problems to find the lethality rate is that there are much more unreported cases of mild infections than of deaths. And I think the best thing where we can go for, for real data about um, total cases is South Korea. In South Korea, uh, there has been very aggressive and extensive diagnosis. The reported cases uh, is, is around 10,000. That's 162. So the mortality rate that is reported in South Korea is, is, is smaller, is 1.6% as comparison to the 3.4%. And I don't think that's due because they, they, there is less deaths in South Korea. I just think that they are diagnosing more and therefore the number of diagnostic cases is higher than in the rest of the countries. But even in South Korea, I think that they are even more infected than diagnosis cases. So if we look, for example, in South Korea, what is the proportion of population that is from 0 to 14 years old? This is 13%. But if you look, what is the proportion of reported infections? Not, not deaths, not mortality, not severe cases. Just the percentage of reported infections in the same population is 3%, which is four to five times less than the actual abundance of this population. So either the, the infants and the kids are less infected or they are equally infected, they are not diagnosed. And I think that's more likely that that's the case. And uh, this discrepancy is likely due to less diagnosis in this group because they only have mild symptoms or no symptoms. So to me, it seems likely that there are 10 times more infected people than diagnosed in the world. And this will reduce the mortality from 4.8, from 3.4 to around 0 0.4, which is a number of lethal infections that is equal to what it is four years of seasonal flu combined. So what this virus seems to be causing, if, if they, it goes full, full blown, 
it will be something similar to what it is combined for seasonal flu uh, seasons, if that number is correct. And then, so so if uh, if that number is correct, which again I'm not quite sure, but I, I would like to know opinions from people. Let's see what happens in Spain. In Spain, they just, we assume 0.4% mortality. Uh, there is uh, sorry about the about this typo. These are the number of total deaths in Spain, and that will correspond to two millions of total infected people, but not in March 31, but in March 17, because are the people that were infected at this time, and then they are dying, and there is, we still don't have the people that are dying two weeks before. So if it's, if it's likely that in two weeks the infections have been duplicated, we will have on March 31st an estimate of around 4 million infections. And this is roughly already 10% of the population of Spain, which I think if this is correct, then we, we can start to assume that we are getting uh, now possibility of starting to think about herd immunity, which I think is a, is a, is a good thing. All right, so, so this, is, uh, this is just about some, uh, some thoughts that I have about number of, of of infections that there is. Um, let, me, let me now show you actual data that we have been doing here. So first of all, what we know about kinetics of viral shedding, we have been uh, determining that. This is an example of, of one patient uh, the, that it was uh, detected as positive on the, of March uh, 4. And uh, viral loads were determined using actually the same primers that I use for a diagnosis, which is a set of three primers, N1, N2, and N3. The viral loads uh, are due now by quantitative RT-PCR with the diagnostic uh, um, uh, primers. They seem to be very similar between the three primers, which is what we expect. And they go down uh, two logs uh, it's at, at day around six days after diagnosis. And then finally, around eight days after diagnosis, in a case that is a mild case of infection, they, they seem to disappear. So uh, then we have some more examples like this. So it looks like on average from, from detection till, till uh, and symptoms till uh, the, the virus is, is stops shedding is around uh, seven days. They could be longer in some people. They could be shorter in some other people. And these are data from a colleague of mine in, in, in the department, Viviana Simon. Now, we have been also interested in looking what is the diversity of, uh, of uh, sequences of uh, SARS coronavirus 2 in New York, which is what we are here. Uh, we know New York is the epicenter. Uh, we have right now 100 complete genome sequences from different cases in New York uh, that we are still analyzing here. I show you the, the first ones that we have put together, which are the first three cases and the first three sequences that they were available from New York. Uh, New York 1, New York 2, and New York NYU. And New York NYU was a sequence that was obtained by our um, colleagues in, uh, in NYU in uh, New York University. The others come from Mount Sinai. And, and here what you can see is there are some polymorphisms that are highlighted in terms of the sequence. But if we look uh, for, um, I don't know, you can see the pointer. But if you look, uh, for example, to the isolate New York 1, this uh, gets together with this blue, all the sequences that they are reported that are sequences coming from Australia. So this, we think it was an introduction from Australia, but if you go to this New York 2, this is together with sequences that are here in yellow, phylogenetically related, which are coming from Asia. So this, uh, this particular uh, uh, patient came infected with viruses that are circulating prevalently, more prevalently in Asia. And then finally, this uh, NYU isolate come here with these uh, green um, uh, samples, uh, very close to the risk class samples that are samples that come from Europe. And that was in the in the very beginning of, of, of infection, something March 10, before there was so many cases. So it was already apparent that in New York, uh, there were multiple introductions coming from multiple countries that came to New York. And uh, I think that these multiple introductions have made possible what is now converted New York in the epicenter of the infections because they came from multiple times, multiple places at the same time, uh, at the time that there were not so many travel restrictions. All right, so um, in terms of a therapy, uh, there are things that are in clinical studies. I, I guess there they were some talks about it, some of them like hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, remdesivir. Uh, I think it's very interesting to try to use plasma from convalescent individuals because that's something that has been uh, that has been successful with other viral infections, like uh, it's been used, for example, for uh, can be used for rabies or can be used for measles, especially immunosuppressed uh, individuals that they cannot be vaccinated with the measles vaccines. 
Uh, there are some other things that are being tried. We hope that some of them will be uh, successful. But then there is the question of how can we can find also possible new therapies in case that some of them are not uh, very good, very effective, or not effective at all. And one thing that uh, a lot of us are interested in academia, and as well as in industry, is to try to do drug repurposing. So drug repurposing consists in drugs that are already using humans in different clinical trials or for different indications that they have non-toxicity, they have non-PK, they have non-bioavailability properties, so one knows how one can need to dose a person. And these drugs are targeting, in many instances, many different host factors, some of which may actually be promoting viral replication because viruses are using host factors in order to be able to replicate. So we have taken predictions based on molecular studies that they were done of protein-protein interactions with our colleagues at uh, UCSF, and then uh, have uh, made some predictions about some potential um, compounds that may uh, inhibit viral replication based on ability potentially to inhibit some of these proteins, host proteins that are interacting with viral proteins. And then we are testing them for inhibition of replication in tissue culture. And uh, we will reduce the, like that the number of, of drugs that are, make an impact in the inhibition of viral replication. But we hope that there will be some that can be moved then to find impact in animal models, and the ones that are working pro uh, hopefully can move quickly into clinical studies because they are drugs that have already known toxicity and PK. Right now, we have uh, tested something like uh, around 40 different uh, drugs from these predictions, and here you saw examples and compounds. I'm not giving names, not because I, I don't want to share the data, but because I think they are too preliminary and I don't want then people to jump into it while we need to make sure that these compounds are working the way we are working. But as you can see, we have set up an infection assay for inhibition of replication, in which we can detect percentage of infection in the presence of a compound and compare it with cell viability. You want to have something that inhibits infection, but is not toxic for the cells. And this is an example of one compound in which the percentage of infection is not changing, so it's not antiviral and the cell viability is also not changing, so uh, it's, it this has basically doesn't have no effect. But we have also entire examples like this compound 2 that look very promising. Uh, this, the cell viability is maintained at high concentration, but they start to inhibit viral replication at concentrations that are around micromolar concentrations. I see 50 is 1.2 micromolar. So we think that this could be a, a good compound that can be moved forward into animal models to see whether they make an impact or not in, in uh, viral replication in vivo. And, and also we have some Hello. examples of compounds. Uh, yeah, two, you can... two, minutes. two minutes. Two minutes, okay. We, can, we have some examples like this compound three in which we can see that actually it's increasing viral replication, probably because it's interact with the viral factor. This uh, obviously is not good for therapy, but it could be good to increase the levels of viral of virus production in tissue culture. Okay, then how about virus vaccines? There are multiple strategies. Uh, we are working also in, in some vaccines. There are many things that can be used as vaccine. There are other considerations. Uh, there is the route of administration, but the main vaccines are based on production of a spike protein, immunization with the spike protein in order to produce neutralizing antibodies. The ideal vaccine should provide long lasting protection against infection in single shot in all groups. But even a vaccine that provides short time partial protection against disease after several shots will be of great help right now. And protection in the elderly is always difficult, but if the vaccine is used and provides protection from infection in everybody, that will do herd immunity and even the elderly will be, will be um, protected. Now, the problem with, with uh, the vaccine is not that, they, I mean, there are several vaccines that enter already clinical trials, but uh, the, the path, the useful path is you need to show immunogenicity and protection in animal models. You need to manufacture in a way that is not toxic for people. You need to do toxicity and studies to be able to enter clinical trials. And then you go through phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials, which are time consuming because at the end you want to prove that the vaccine does not have side effects and the vaccine uh, is, is working. And there have been in the past problematic vaccines. There was a vaccine that was done in the 70s with children vaccinated with inactivated RSV vaccine that had enhanced disease. There was case of Guillain-Barre syndrome after swine influenza vaccination in the 70s, and there is a non-antibody dependent enhancement in dengue virus vaccinated kids. So that's the reason why we really need to test the vaccines in order to be able, if, if they are making an impact, and that's the reason why it takes so long, around one year, to know whether the vaccines are working. Now, 
Do we have viral vaccines that are successes? Yes, we have a lot of examples of viral vaccines that are successes. There are some vaccines that are so-and-so, so not, not very good protection, but it can help in some instances, like influenza and dengue. And there are some that are symptomatic, like HIV, RSV, as I mentioned, because the problem with vaccine enhancement, or the herpes virus and hepatitis C virus. I hope that these virus belong to this group, this group of easy to make viral vaccines. And if this is the case, which is the, long, the, the larger group, if this is the case, then hopefully the vaccines that are entering clinical trials will be effective. All right, um, so what we are doing in terms of vaccines, we are working in two approaches. One is based on NDV vectors expressing S in collaboration with Peter Palace and Randy Albrecht. And the other is based on attenuated viruses. This is the vaccine is actually developed in Luis and Juanes and Isabel Solar Laboratories, and we are providing complementing assays to figure out what is the mechanism of attenuation of the virus that they are making. So thanks a lot, and I take any questions. Okay, thank you, Adolfo. Uh, uh, two questions. Uh, uh, with the data and evidence we have, uh, do you think that this pandemic could have been prevented? Well, prevention of this pandemic would have been if we would have prevented the first outbreak. And the outbreak happened in a live market that was due most likely to a bat virus that went into the live market, perhaps some amplification in animals, and then an infection of people. Now, so this comes from a group of viruses that are these SARS-like viruses. We already knew that there were SARS-like viruses in bats. Uh, we knew already what SARS can do because of what happened with SARS. So the thing that how this thing could have been prevented, maybe other things not, but this thing could have been prevented if we would have stopped it, the end, the mixing of infected bats with SARS-like viruses in live uh, markets. With that, I don't mean stop the live the live markets. With that mean what what does I mean? If there is bats in the live markets, they need to be monitored for the presence of viruses that could be dangerous for humans. And if we would have done that, most likely these viruses will have not been jumping. Uh, now, there are some other viruses that are more difficult to, to prevent than this one. But this one, if it really came from bats, which is most likely the case, and it's clear that came the epicenter came from a live uh, animal market in Wuhan, this virus could have been stopped just by monitoring uh, the bats that are in the market, monitoring for the presence of SARS-like viruses. And if there is bats like that, then not entering the market. Adolfo, uh, last question. It is possible to acquire immunity to the virus? Yes. Uh, I mean, the experimental infections in animals have shown that they become immune, uh, that they develop neutralizing antibodies. It's known that people that are exposed and have uh, some type of disease and recover, they have antibodies also against the virus, so immunity is developed. The question is, is immunity protective or not? And from animal studies, it looks like the immunity is protective. Uh, it tends to be in humans whether this immunity is protective or not. But uh, um, I would think that unless there is something very strange with this virus, that people that have been exposed already to the virus, they have some levels of protection. And with that, I mean some levels. They may be completely protected or they may be partially protected. And if they are partially protected, they will be protected from having severe disease and also they, they will be less contagious if they get a second infection. And I think that that's what we probably will expect, which means that as we get more and more infected people, there will be more and more herd immunity due to natural acquired immunity. And hopefully this, if there is a lot of people, then the virus will stop spreading as fast. Totally agree with you. Adolfo, thank you very much for your presentation. Okay, thank you.